Toka never expected that his entire class would be transported to another world, where everyone became heroes, except for himself, who was abandoned by the goddess. He was to be banished to a perilous abandoned relic, simply because he had the worst aptitude. Refusing to accept why someone from the lower ranks should be bullied, he vowed to survive and return. Before this, on their way to a school field trip on a bus, the class president, Ayaka, was harassed by a boastful Shugo, while only the highest status students jeered alongside, and the other classmates remained silent. For someone on the fringe like Tuka, his presence was as inconsequential as air, seemingly useless even if he were there. Suddenly, Tuka remembered being abused by his father as a child, while his mother indifferently watched TV, ignoring his pleas, which did nothing to help. Thus, he understood the despair Ayaka felt now, and told Shugo to stop bothering her. However, Shugo scoffed at him disdainfully, not regarding him as a person at all, filled with arrogance. Yet, Tuka's effort wasn't completely futile. Some higher-ranked classmates stood up to speak out. Even someone as insignificant as Toka dared to speak up for justice, prompting them to intervene for the sake of their reputation. Shugo, not daring to defy them, returned Ayaka's belongings and promised not to harass her again. However, Shugo, still furious, targeted another low-status classmate, kicking his seat continuously until he cried in fear. The teacher only advised Shugo to moderate his behavior, worried about the trouble if she were to commit suicide. As Tuka lamented the darkness of the world, a beam of light appeared. They were summoned by a goddess to another world. In this world, whenever the evil demon emperor arose, she would summon heroes from other worlds. 200 years ago, it was under the hero's valiant efforts that the evil demon king was defeated. Many years later, the demon emperor has resurrected and they were chosen as the new heroes. The classmates were confused, but under the teacher's guidance, they decided to follow the goddess's lead. The goddess explained that to return to their original world, they must open a reverse portal, which required the element of the evil king. In essence, they must defeat the demon emperor to return. The goddess knelt before them sincerely, pleading for their help in this world. Seeing her earnestness, they agreed to her request. However, being ordinary people, how could they possibly confront the demon emperor? Thus, the time to unlock the world of heroic potential arrived. The classmates all had decent aptitudes, while the previously bullying Shugo was of superior level. Takudo was exceptional, his power shattering the crystal ball. The goddess announced his rank as the highest S-class, and Ayaka's test results were also an astonishing S-class. Subsequently, many A-rank heroes appeared, followed by a third S-rank. This excited the goddess greatly, and she declared that they were the highest qualified group of heroes she had ever led. When it came to Tuka's turn, his test results were shockingly weak, the weakest the goddess had ever seen, and she completely disregarded his rank. Indeed, even in another world, he still seemed utterly useless. However, unexpectedly, a classmate who was also usually unnoticed and had been bullied on the bus awakened to possess the strongest dark energy. Following this, everyone began to practice and familiarize themselves with their new powers. Tuka, checking his panel, discovered his rank was E, the lowest in the class. The goddess then announced a special segment where Toka was brought to the center of the gathering. According to the traditions of this world, the lowest-ranked hero would be sent to an ancient relic. This was somewhat cruel. Survive, and you're free. Fail, and it's likely death. Upon hearing this, Tuka revealed he possessed a skill called Status Abnormality Bestowal, which the goddess dismissed as utterly worthless, a useless skill. Tuka was indignant. Why should he be banished just like that? The rest of the class couldn't bear to watch, feeling Tuka was wasting everyone's time. Even those who had low status like him in the real world joined in to kick him while he was down, despite Tuka having helped them before. The teleportation circle was then activated, and Tuka had no escape from his fate of being sent to the relic. In the end, only Ayaka spoke up for him, pleading with the goddess to spare Tuka. However, the goddess, having lost her patience, struck her down with a blow. Seeing the unreasonable goddess and his classmates betrayal, Tuka vowed to show them all. Upon arriving at the abandoned relic, he immediately faced danger. Against a clearly more powerful foe, he could only desperately flee. The fear brought tears to his eyes. Faced with death, 
His bitterness overcame his fear. Disrespected in the real world and abandoned in another, he refused to die just like that. He wanted power. He wanted revenge. Surprisingly, his desperate attempt managed to control the monster. As he turned to flee, he encountered another creature and had to use the same tactic, which to his amazement, worked again. But now, his greatest despair was that his MP was depleted and another beast was hot on his heels. Facing this situation, he had no choice but to fight with all he had, just like he had survived on his own as a child. The goddess could never have imagined that Tuka, who was considered a mere E-rank talent and a waste, actually possessed the most bizarre skill in the class. She teleported Tuka to the hardest dungeon in the world, intending to send him to his death. Little did she know, Tuka's seemingly weak, toxic skill actually caused damage based on a percentage of health. And he also had a skill that could put targets to sleep, which was used in combination. At that moment, Tuka was being attacked by a group of monsters at level hundreds. Even the goddess herself would probably be toyed with to death in such a situation. Tuka thought he could only use his skills to buy time. Just as his MP was depleted and all the monsters closed in again, preparing for a desperate fight, Tuka suddenly heard the sound of leveling up, and his level soared to 258. It was then that Tuka realized his toxic skill was a noble percentage-based health-depleting ability. Most crucially, since the level increase, his skills could now target multiple enemies. At this moment, the terrifying monsters in Tuka's eyes were just moving experience points. As a large number of bodies fell, the few remaining monsters turned and ran. After successfully dealing with the immediate crisis, Tuka's stomach protested. But it was clear there was no food around. However, he then thought about it. The monsters he had just defeated were just like chicken and beef. So Tuka prepared to cut some meat to eat, but the monster's skin was too tough. And as a mage like Tuka, he couldn't cut through it. Therefore, he turned his attention to the eyes. After struggling with disgust and eating the eyeballs, Tuka discovered they were highly toxic and inedible. No wonder no one could walk out of this place. Just when he felt despair, Tuka suddenly noticed that the bag the goddess had given him was glowing. He opened the bag and found it contained beef jerky and happy water. This item could apparently generate food based on one's thoughts. Initially, Tuka was dissatisfied with the shabby bag the goddess had given him, but now he felt it was the only good thing she had done. After killing countless monsters, Tuka's level rose to over 600. He continued exploring the dungeon and found a large number of human skeletons along the way. Tuka decisively chose to loot the corpses, collecting everything from gems to other items. Gradually, he sensed something was wrong. All these humans were sent here by the goddess, but clearly, these skeletons had been very powerful in life. According to the goddess, weren't all the talents she teleported E-rank? It wasn't until Tuka read a manual left by one of the corpses that he understood that in this world, E-rank was actually the highest talent. Ironically, the goddess feared that they would hold others back, so she sent what she saw as the useless ones here to die. While looting the corpses, Tuka collected many enhancements left by his predecessors, such as potions lost since ancient times, or runes capable of unleashing the power of forbidden spells. He also learned about the boss of the labyrinth. Looking at his own status bar, Tuka, now at level 1200, felt he was strong enough to initiate an attack on the boss. But as soon as he stepped out, his palm was instantly pierced. He hadn't expected the monster to react so quickly. To use his skills, Tuka had to raise his hand and recite the skill name. Now, how would he be able to defeat the boss, especially since his first stealth attack had failed, alerting the boss who had now fully awakened? Instead of attacking immediately, the boss summoned a horde of zombies, each bearing the face of a human who had previously died here. Tuka only used sleep to control them. After receiving so much help from his predecessors, he couldn't bring himself to harm these familiar faces. Little did he know, his helpless demeanor only excited the boss more. But the more excited the boss got, the harder Tuka performed. The boss was enjoying Tuka's despair. At the moment when the boss was most enjoying himself, Tuka unleashed his skill. He had only feigned incompetence to exploit a deadly weakness common among the arrogant. As long as he could hit the target, no matter how much health the target had, Tuka could control and poison them directly. After defeating the boss, the souls that had been imprisoned and tortured for years were also freed. Each one showed kindness to Tuka before dissipating, 
advising him to make good use of their wealth or skills. Afterward, Tuka took the gem from the boss's forehead, which opened the door. Now it was time for his revenge on the goddess. The girl casually swung the girl casually swung her dagger, and the jung her dagger, and the giant tree behind her split into giant tree behind her split into two in an instant. Two in an instant. This was the holy technique. This was the holy technique of the thief class. Of the thief class. The dragon blade. The dragon blade. Then she pulled then. She pulled out the shadowless sword. Pulled out the shadowless sword. Showing nor the swordsman. Showing nor the swordsman class's holy technique. Class's holy technique. It turns out. It turns out. The girl's purpose in demonstra the girl's purpose in demonstrating her power was to ask rating her power was to ask Nor to be her master. Nor to be her master. Little did she know. Little did she know at that moment. Nor was at that moment. Nor was utterly bewildered. Was utterly bewildered. After all, he after all, he only knew one move. Only knew one move. Parry. Why would this parry? Why would this genius, proficient as genius, proficient in six class techniques, in six class techniques, want him as a master? Want him as a master? To show the girl his own to show the girl his own weakness, nor used a plain weakness, nor used a plain and simple life skill. Plain and simple life skill. Unexpectedly. Unexpectedly. This act only deepened the girl. This act only deepened the girl's misunderstanding. Girl's misunderstanding. Aside from Lindbergh, aside from Lindbergh, another person had recently witnessed. Another person had recently witnessed Nor's capabilities. Witnessed Nor's capabilities. Gilbert, known. Gilbert, known as the Saint of Spears, as the Saint of Spears, and a battle enthusiast, and a battle enthusiast, often challenges strong. Often challenges strong opponents to duels. Opponents to duels. Today, he had approached today, he had approached Nor. But as the fight Nor. But as the fight progressed, he realized progressed. He realized something was off. Realized something was off. No matter how he attacked, he no matter how he attacked, he couldn't hit his opponent. Couldn't hit his opponent. Nor thought Gilbert was deliber Nor thought Gilbert was deliberately holding back. Deliberately holding back. Reluctantly telling him not to worry. Reluctantly telling him not to worry about him. And to go all worry about him and to go all out. Hearing this, out. Hearing this, Gilbert became serious. Gilbert became serious, and his speed increased sign and his speed increased significantly. However, significantly. However, to Nor, although Gilbert was a Nor, although Gilbert was faster, he was comp faster. He was completely unguarded at the moment of completely unguarded at the moment of each dodge. It seemed dodge. It seemed as if he was intentionally allowed as if he was intentionally allowing himself to be attacked himself to be attacked nor believe these were delib nor believe these were deliberate flaws and he were flaws and he must not be deceived he must not be deceived unbeknownst to him unbeknownst to him gilbert was profoundly shocked gilbert was profoundly shocked no matter which shocked no matter which spear technique he employed spear technique he employed he just couldn't hit his opponent he just couldn't hit his opponent then nor asked him. then nor asked him to speed up even more him to speed up even more. An angry Gilbert unleashed an angry Gilbert unleashed his ultimate move thinking he had his ultimate move thinking he had the upper hand. But when the upper hand. But when the smoke cleared, he found his smoke cleared, he found his opponent had already dodged. His opponent had already dodged. Yet nor conceded yet nor conceded defeat and left. Did defeat and left. Fearing for his safety afterward. Fearing for his safety afterward. He had thought he was improved. He had thought he was improving. But Gilbert's moving, but Gilbert's move dispelled that notion. Move dispelled that notion. At that moment, he had. At that moment, he had used all his strength to enhance. Used all his strength to enhance his body and stealth. Enhance his body and stealth. Just managing to dodge that. Just managing to dodge that shot. Had Gilbert shot. Had Gilbert not intentionally slowed down, he not intentionally slowed down. He would have been dead. Indeed, would have been dead. Indeed, a true. The man possesses a skill that can inflict abnormal statuses on enemies. Whether it's rendering the opponent immobile, slowly poisoning them to death, or putting a sleep-deprived beautiful girl into a deep sleep, he can successfully apply it 100% of the time if he so desires. However, this skill is uniquely ineffective against a goddess, simply because she has a blessing that grants her immunity to any negative statuses. Therefore, if Tuka wants to get revenge on the goddess, 
he must first find a witch capable of deciphering the index of forbidden spells. Then, he can use a forbidden spell to break the goddess's blessing. But before that, Tuka wants to strengthen a slime first, since it can sense the location of others. Using a guide to another world, combined with rumors he heard from other adventurers, Tuka quickly found a material suitable for strengthening the slime. It was the bone powder of the skeleton king of Final Embrace, found in this maze. Coincidentally, a new floor had recently appeared in this maze, and the local lord was recruiting a large number of adventurers to conquer it. Anyone who could retrieve the Dragon Eye Holy Grail, a treasure sleeping in the maze, would be rewarded with 300 gold coins by the lord. Thus, Tuka decisively chose to sign up. However, while in line, Tuka saw a blonde man harassing a young lady behind him. Although the lady was wrapped up tightly, the blonde man recognized her at a glance. It was Saras, the wanted elf princess and former head of the knights, because Monk had once invited her to dinner, but was ruthlessly rejected. Monk, holding a grudge, had such a deep impression of Saras that even if she turned to ash, he could recognize her, not to mention her uniquely elfish long ears peeking out from under her cloak, which directly betrayed her identity. Saying so, Monk pulled open Saras's cloak. However, Saras had long used magic to alter her appearance. Seeing her human-like ears, Monk was stunned and ultimately could only flee the scene, embarrassed by his mistake. Later, Tuka found Saras. Although she had changed her appearance, Tuka recognized her at a glance. Tuka sought her help to pick some items for exploring the maze. After buying some items, Tuka, as agreed, gave the girl three silver coins. But as they were parting, Sarah suddenly fainted on the ground. Seeing her dark circles, Tuka knew it was due to lack of rest, so he suggested she find an inn to rest. After expressing her thanks to Tuka, Sarah hurriedly left. Then Tuka headed to the maze alone, but right upon entering, he saw two young guys being chased by a monster. After the young guys ran away, Tuka realized this monster was a juvenile version of the bull demon previously encountered in the maze. So, Tuka directly applied a combination of paralysis and poisoning, then pulled out the newly bought dagger and easily dispatched the monster with a single stab. When the young guys returned with their older brother, all they saw was the monster's body, killed with a single strike. And with that discovery, they recognized Tuka as a master. Little did they know that such monsters were mere trash to Tuka, not even yielding any experience points. As Tuka proceeded downward, he encountered Monk again. From the looks of it, it was clear that Monk was planning to take revenge on the elf, Saras, intending to punish her severely. Hearing their foul language, Tuka could hardly stand it and stepped forward. After immobilizing them with paralysis, he also inflicted a poison status. Tuka showed no mercy towards such scum. Seeing Monk still shouting in such a situation, Tuka couldn't help but laugh before he turned and walked away, leaving Monk and his group as fodder for the monsters. Tuka continued to overpower everything along the way. The monsters couldn't last more than two and a half seconds in his hands, and the sight of their bodies, unmarred by any wounds, scared many other adventurers away. After all, such methods were too eerie. Soon, Tuka reached the deepest part of the labyrinth and found the Dragon Eye Holy Grail spoken of by the Lord. However, noticing a statue nearby, Tuka knew that as soon as he picked up the Holy Grail, the statue would come to life. Decisively, he applied paralysis and poison to it. The statue could only watch in extreme reluctance as Tuka took the Holy Grail, then crumbled into pieces in the same state of frustration. While Tuka was examining the Holy Grail, his slime sounded an alarm, and the person who arrived was Saras, who had met Tuka twice before. Generously, Tuka handed the Holy Grail to Saras, knowing she was short on money and could exchange it for gold coins with the Lord. After all, Tuka wasn't lacking in funds. What he needed was only the bone powder of the Skeleton King, hidden beneath a secret door. However, Saras didn't want to take something for nothing, so she offered to become Tuka's guard as a way to repay him. Hearing this, Tuka quickly agreed, as he was in need of a melee fighter, and keeping her nearby for emergencies seemed like a good choice. After reaching the secret door, Saras showed off her abilities, earning a couple of compliments from Tuka. However, seeing her dark circles, Tuka felt a pang of sympathy, so he found a secret room and suggested that Saras rest there. Saras was a bit worried at first because she could still sense the presence of monsters nearby. 
Reluctantly, Tuca brought out the slime and explained the situation to Saris. Relieved, she agreed to lie down on a nearby stone slab to rest for a while. But Tuca felt it wasn't enough, so he directly applied a sleep status to her, causing her to fall into a deep sleep. Unexpectedly, as Saras fell into slumber, her appearance also returned to normal. Meanwhile, the mastermind who had sent men to kill Saras discovered that his four subordinates were already dead, but he mistakenly thought it was Saras's doing. This seemed to ignite the man's fighting spirit. 